Thanks everyone for coming. Welcome out. So uh, what is this? The fifth or sixth talk here? Six. Six, yeah, right. Because I started in January. It's easy to keep track of it like that. Um yeah, uh, and today we're gonna talk about one of my favorite topics, uh beer. Um yes. Um so um to understand the history of beer in the Erie Canal, um, just like always with the Erie Canal, it's important that you understand uh, the geography of New York that made both the Erie Canal possible and the importance it played in the alcohol industry uh, as well. Uh, geography is pretty essential to both stories. So hopefully you recognize this. This is New York State, right? Um, so New York, um, has an incredible uh, natural transportation system uh, going all the way back to kind of the ice age. Um, the glaciers melt, leaving behind this early lake. Instead of going up the St. Lawrence, bust through the Appalachian Mountains via the Mohawk River uh, and the Hudson, creating the only gap in the Appalachian Mountains under 600 feet in elevation between Georgia and Maine, which is critical uh, for transportation. You've got these great inland waterways uh, that allow for relatively easy transportation. And also, uh, starting in 1817, the easy ability to dig a canal uh, from Lake Erie over to Albany. Uh, but also, um, this geography is unique in a lot of ways. Uh, it will prove, after the Erie Canal opens, incredibly uh, good uh, at producing all the ingredients you need for alcohol, uh, which now, because you have a newly open transportation system, you can get to marketplaces. Uh, so let's look at that um, a little bit. Uh, so the Mohawk Valley, which we've already identified, uh, as well as the Hudson, and then the Genesee Valley, uh, all have a really fertile soil. And again, they're all in river valleys. So they have pretty easy access to water. Uh, this makes it great for growing grains, uh, like wheat, uh, corn, barley, et cetera, all of which are important in making uh, a number of uh, liquors uh, and also beer. Um, the Finger Lakes, as I'm sure many of us are aware, have an excellent microclimate for growing grapes in. Uh, so this area is going to become important for wine making in the future. Uh, the shores of Lake Ontario have an excellent microclimate um, for growing fruits, pretty essential. Uh, for making things like cider. And then um, the hills, especially of central New York, uh, have the perfect kind of elevation, climate, and amount of moisture uh, for growing hops, which, as we all know, you need to make beer. Um, so uh, let's look at the early history of alcohol in New York State, around when this is being made. This map is from 1809, so before the Erie Canal. Um, the Haudenosaunee, the original uh, inhabitants of this land, largely did not have alcohol uh, before European settlers came. Uh, the first settlers to reach New York are the Dutch, um, and this is going to be important throughout much of our story. Different ethnic groups usually have different drinking traditions and drinking cultures, and that really impacts what's being produced in these areas, uh, how people are drinking, and what they're drinking. Uh, so the first folks are the Dutch. Uh, going up the Hudson River and kind of the first part of the Mohawk. Uh, the Dutch really like beer and they like whiskey. Um, there's a number of uh, breweries in the 1600s during Dutch colonial rule. Um, it's really, if you go to the New York State Museum, you can see uh, an early um, kind of beer tank where they were brewing beer from, a, I think the brewery is from like the 1670s or something. And, uh, Dutch Albany, uh, at that time, Beverwick or Beaver Town, uh, because of the importance of the beaver trade uh, there. Um, yeah, so uh, people get started brewing beer really early. Uh, but then the British come in. Um, and uh, the British don't really like their beer at this point. They're drinking primarily wines, rum, and brandy. Uh, so uh, during British colonial rule, uh, beer drinking kind of dies. Uh, out, except in the Mohawk and the upper Hudson areas. Uh, there you've still got a pretty significant Dutch, Dutch and uh, the Mohawk, Palatinate German uh, population that's still 
brewing beer, uh, but largely for home consumption. There's no kind of commercial uh, trans transportation of alcohol. Uh, and that's also because this transportation system we talked about at the start, it's still not good enough to send things to market largely. Uh, so again, just like in farming, you're mainly just producing for you and your family uh, at home. Uh, but the Erie Canal changes stuff up. Uh, built between 1817 and 1825, alcohol is critical in this waterway's construction. Uh, this being the frontiers, not a lot of cash uh, out on you know, the, uh, the extremities of kind of New York's uh, dominions, uh, if you will. Uh, no banks really handy. So workers are largely paid in kind to do uh, this work. So room and board, but also very critically, whiskey. Um, one historian, um, Peter Way, he's a labor historian, uh, he estimated the average canal worker was paid between 10 and 17 ounces of whiskey a day while digging the canal. And that's just on the job. Um, <laughs> they Basically would then, the <laughs> yeah, the, the money they got afterwards was often spent uh, also on more whiskey. Um, and there's a lot of reasons um, for that. Um, made the workforce a lot more pliable. There's kind of a, a saying that, um, what is it? Um, that no one would build a canal sober. Um, it's just horrible work. So you usually need to get a little drunk to want to try to do this. Um, so there's. Yeah. Don't ask, what were the injuries like? I mean, if they were drunk, how did they not get injured? Yes. Oh, they did get injured a lot. <laughs> um, this, I can only imagine. <laughs> yes. Uh, so what we see here, this is the construction of the deep cut at Lockport. Um, this is where some of the hardest drinking occurs um, in the whole uh, session. There's a great book, uh, Stairway to Empire, um, which talks specifically about the digging of this. He goes through their receipts uh, of of these canal contractors, they're just buying barrels and barrels of whiskey uh, and just how much it's like thousands of gallons of whiskey are drank to construct this section. And it says in it, uh, it's pretty funny, I thought when I was reading it, nonchalantly, it's just like, this kind of explains all of the injuries that occurred. Because to do this, you had to blast this out with black powder. And uh, supposedly the workers just, if they set fire in the hole, uh, would, would simply put their shovels over their heads and uh, the direct quote is, occasionally one would be crushed by a giant stone. Uh, so uh, yeah, as you can see, it kind of doles out your workforce, gets them kind of lubricated enough to, to do the digging. Uh, also, kind of the darker side of that is this is the frontier. If you are fostering, you're, if you're giving someone this much whiskey every day, you're fostering a chemical dependency in them. They are not going to leave this horrible job because you're the one who has their next ration of whiskey uh, as well. So that's um, the kind of darker side of the story. Um, canal uh, work teams would often hire um, generally a young boy who would be called the jigger boss. Uh, his job was to go around and make sure everyone was getting uh, their allotments of whiskey every day. And there is one uh, that we have no full confirmation of the story, but uh, everyone tells it on the Erie Canal uh, that as they were nearing completion of the canal, um, they really needed to get it open before the winter came because they had this whole party planned out and everything for Dwight Clinton and others to, to go down it. Um, they would put a barrel of whiskey where you, they wanted the workers to dig to. Um, and once they reached that point, um, you know, you could stop for the rest of the day uh, and enjoy that barrel you had just reached. Um, so yeah, whiskey, as you can see, is pretty important and also really early in canal trade. Um, whiskey is essential as a trade good, especially before the canals fully open. Uh, so the first boats start traveling down in 1820, uh, when only the section between uh, the Seneca River and uh, the Mohawk are open. Uh, this is a lot more helpful, but it's not perfect. Uh, and uh, it's, it might take a few weeks. Uh, grain, you know, can go bad. Um, and also the importance of shipping grain uh, is that you have to, like most bulk commodities, you have to shell it, ship it as cheaply as possible. 
Otherwise, you lose all profit margins. However, you can change that if you switch the grain into something else, whiskey. Uh, farmers convert large amounts of their grains that they're shipping to market into whiskey so that one, it won't spoil on the journey, but two, you can sell a barrel of whiskey for way more than you could a barrel of wheat. Uh, so your profit margins are a lot higher. It allows you to ship things farther. This is an incredibly important trade good uh, in kind of the early American Republic. If they're making whiskey, they don't need to ship it very far, do they? They just sell it to the Erie Canal. Oh, yeah, there's that. You could do that. But <laughs> uh, America at the time, um, one historian said this was uh, the early 19th century. It's America's great drinking binge. Um, I think it was John Adams. He would drink like a, a bottle of whiskey a day uh, himself. James Madison, like bottles of wine each like day. Aver uh, the average American, I went to uh, the Texas State Museum. They had this incredible display on uh, prohibition. The average American drank something like 25 gallons of alcohol a year uh, in this time period. Um, we today drink about one and a half, I think it is, or something. Uh, it was incredible seeing the like graphic that they had. Uh, yeah. Does it have anything to do with the, the availability of clean drinking water? Yes, that that definitely uh, contributed to how people are drinking. Uh, you know, sometimes things like beer and things in the morning. Um, but yeah, you know, everyone's just drinking a lot. Uh, but yeah, definitely lack of water quality. One more yes. question. Like, so at the time, were those jobs considered to be, wow, this is a great, well-paying job? Or was it like, I can't get anything else, so I better do this? That's a great question. Um, Erie Canal work was actually fairly well-paid, though it did get a lot worse as it progressed. Uh, that's when you start seeing, well, that's when you start getting into the harder jobs like this. These were not super well-paid. They're well-paid for canal labor uh, and like kind of these relatively low skilled jobs. Um, but over time, um, canal work just got lower and lower paid. Um, they begin bringing in more uh, immigrants, specifically Irish immigrants to do these jobs. Um, yeah, so eventually it becomes a job completely stigmatized to only the Irish, uh, essentially by the 1830s. Um, so an excellent question. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's them digging the canal. Uh, but there you have it. Whiskey helped build the canal and helped fund it for the first few years uh, due to taxes on that whiskey that's moving. You should have called it the Whiskey Canal. There you go. Well, I, I doubt many people on it would have had a huge problem. Uh, uh, um, so there you have it. There's the Erie Canal, 363 miles long, or the Whiskey Canal. We can informally call it that. Um, <laughs> overcoming 571 feet in elevation. And as soon as this thing opens up, we're seeing um, people start producing alcohol along its banks almost immediately. Um, in 1820, uh, at the eastern terminus of the canal, uh, an English immigrant by the name of John Taylor uh, opens up the first brewery in Albany since uh, Dutch settlement. His name is John Taylor. And he locates it at a strategically important uh, transportation location, which is the intersection of uh, the Erie Canal and the Hudson River in Albany. We're gonna see it later in this talk. So if you might not uh, remember that. Uh, 1824, over here in Buffalo, we got our next uh, well-documented Erie Canal side brewery. That is in Buffalo, that of Kane, Peacock, and Relay. Uh, also in 1824, uh, critically, here's Syracuse. This is 10 years later. Uh, but 1824, uh, Syracuse and Central New York gets its first brewery. That of Kellogg and Davenport Mori. Uh, that is also going to be located right on the Erie Canal. And again, at a critical juncture where you can also get fresh water. So, of course, very important for the brewing process. Right here, where the Erie Canal passes over Onondaga Creek. Uh, that is where the first brewery uh, in Syracuse is founded. And it is going to be essential in our story uh, throughout um, this location, throughout this whole talk. So keep in mind uh, where that is. This is Clinton Square right here, uh, where the Erie Canal Museum is right there. Uh, 
Yeah, that's the Erie Canal, today's Erie Boulevard. Is that where Congress Bureau ended up in that same location? No. Uh, Congress is up here on the north side, eventually. Um, okay. So also, I think Congress then moves over this way, but that's after the Canal era. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, um, beer starts to kind of grow, breweries form, and uh, by 1845, uh, 20 years after the Erie Canal has opened, there are 102 breweries in New York State, um, growing from uh, a mere handful prior to the Erie Canal's opening. Um, then the 1840s come and something critical happens. We talked about people, uh, this is gonna be important throughout this, uh, changes in drinking culture. 1840s happen, and uh, there are a number of uh, important things that happen there. Uh, we have an upsurge in immigration to the canal uh, corridor. Uh, immigrants have been coming up the can canal ever since they start digging it. Uh, and then the 1840s happen. First, in Ireland, you have the potato famine, uh, which causes millions of Irish to come over to America. And then in 1848, you have the famous springtime of the peoples. Um, these revolutions uh, for democracy uh, and against kind of monarchy in uh, largely central Europe um, that are crushed in the end, and it sends tons of immigrants coming over to America, most notably uh, German uh, and Czech immigrants. Uh, they're going to be coming over, but yeah, Irish and German immigrants are going to come streaming down uh, the Erie Canal in the mid to late 1840s, and they will bring critical changes in how uh, people produce and consume alcohol along the Erie Canal. Uh, uh, and yeah, each brings its own uh, drinking culture. Um, so uh, the English, who had largely dominated the ethnic makeup uh, of this area, uh, they had preferred for a while uh, your basic ales and porters. Um, but then uh, the Irish bring with them, they also enjoy porters, but also stouts uh, start being produced a lot more along the Erie Canal, while Germans, uh, and like I said, Czechs as well, uh, bring the uh, critical, uh, critical, well, I would say that, but a different style of beer, uh, lagers and pilsners. I am German, so I guess I can say critical, um, right? Um, yeah, uh, so they come down the canal and they bring these new types of beer with them, uh, a bit different than uh, the English ale. Please don't ask me what the difference between all those are. It's technical. I've had brewers explain it to me. I kind of have the gist. But I kind of don't, and I say, okay, you guys can talk about what that means fully. Uh, but anyway, um, so uh, after these immigrants come, beer really starts to boom. Also, the interior of the country, um, so the Great Lakes Basin, it's really starting to experience the full effects uh, of the Erie Canal. Um, lots of new farms are being developed, and there's kind of this cyclical pattern of growth. Um, new York's population keeps skyrocketing throughout this period, as do most uh, of these Midwestern states. Um, and they all are demanding more and more goods and are also able to produce more and more that can be transported uh, along the Erie Canal. Um, so New York becomes America's largest agricultural state. It's producing tons and tons of stuff uh, starting in the 1840s and 1850s. Uh, here's an interesting image from our collection. Does anyone want to guess what these folks are harvesting here? Hmm. It's that actually might be corn in the background, but that's not best. It is hops. Uh, this is a picture in, I believe it is Southern Madison County. Uh, New York is going to become uh, between 1840 and 1900. Uh, they will grow the most hops and brew the most beer of any state in the country. Uh, at one point uh, in the 1880s, uh, Oneida, Madison, Otsego, and Onondaga counties will produce 80% of the nation's hops uh, in their hills. Uh, and that represents uh, around 20 million tons, pounds uh, of hops annually uh, are produced. 
uh, in those four counties uh, along the Erie Canal. Um, I should note that these are enormous events at the time. Uh, the populations of cities like Syracuse decrease uh, during the hot picking season as people move up the hills. Uh, to your point about wages, um, hot picking hops were getting incredibly good prices in the 1860s and 1870s. Uh, so people would leave their kind of city jobs and factories and stuff, go to the hop farms, the whole towns. I mean, this was like their economy for about a month was pick hops. Uh, and they'd have big parties, et cetera. Uh, you can still see kind of traces of that in Madison County. That's where I'm from. Uh, today we have hop, exactly, yep. We got hop fest. Uh, you have, you know, your hop king and queen and everything. Uh, yeah, these are a uh, major social uh, event is picking hops. Um, so yeah, you've got all these hops that are being picked and they're not going that far necessarily. Uh, they are largely going to canal side breweries. Again, this is all about transportation. You never want to move things particularly far. Uh, this is long before today's age where, you know, you get like a peaches that are picked in Georgia, they get shipped for canning in like Argentina, a label slapped on in like Cambodia somewhere, and then they end up in a supermarket in like Michigan. Um, that doesn't exist yet. Uh, so largely, if you're making hops, you don't want them to go bad, you're sending them to a local brewery. Uh, and again, the brewery, this is going to be important later in our story as well, uh, they can't uh, ship their beer nearly as far as we can today. Refrigeration doesn't exist. Uh, beer can go bad, uh, right? Uh, so um, breweries abound in New York State. Uh, 1876, we hit our peak with 393 uh, breweries. In 1870, there were 41 breweries operating in Buffalo alone, uh, utilizing the millions and millions of pounds of hops. Um, and uh, this brewery right here, uh, we've already talked about it. This is the John Taylor and Sons Brewery uh, at uh, the corner of the Erie Canal and the Hudson River. Uh, you can see just boats can easily pull up to it and ship these uh, uh, the beer. Um, it's estimated that at its peak, John Taylor, it's the biggest brewery in America, could ship, could produce 200,000 barrels of beer annually. Uh, and there are reports of uh, Albany, Albany Ale. Um, so we talked about John Taylor. He's an English immigrant. He's largely producing English style beers. So ales, Albany Ale becomes a nationally famous beer. Um, there's a great project out in Albany uh, looking into the history of Albany uh, Ale and Albany Beer in general. They have found advertisements for John Taylor Beer in uh, far away Chicago, uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, they're able to get uh, this beer because they're able to transport it efficiently, you know, by steamboat down the Hudson or cross the Erie Canal and get on a Great Lakes steamboat as well, all the way to a place like Chicago before it's going bad. Uh, so New York's a big advantage uh, in that since, uh, if you will. Um, and this brewery is going to remain open until 1905, just chugging out tons and tons of beer. Uh, now let's look at one of Syracuse's. It's got another one of these behemoths. Um, this is the Greenways. Greenways Brewery, founded by another English immigrant, uh, John Greenways. Uh, so this, where the railroad track here is, that would be Franklin Street today. This is Water Street. And over here, you can kind of see the boat in the corner. That's the Erie Canal. This is built on the exact same location that the brewery of uh, Davenport Mori uh, in Kellogg was built. Um, so the Onondaga Creek's flowing under this brewery right about here, uh, seven stories tall. Uh, for more context, if you don't know the Syracuse streets as well, uh, right across the canal, that's where the Niagara Mohawk built, I guess. Um, so yeah, um, this brewery, uh, founded in 1852 by Greenway. Again, it's making English ales and porters. Uh, seven stories tall, occupies an entire city block. Uh, they could produce about 100,000 barrels of beer annually. Um, it also had uh, one of my favorite uh, canal 
bits of trivia. Uh, they had one of the first ever steamboats on the canal in the 1870s. John Greenway had more money than he knew what to do with. Uh, so he made this boat, uh, the Annie Laurie, named after one of his daughters. Uh, it was this elegant steam yacht made entirely of hardwood, uh, both inside and exterior. Uh, it was a working boat for the brewery. Uh, so we found some articles of it uh, hauling malt and barley down from uh, Oswego uh, to the, the brewery. Uh, but also it was kind of their you know, Budweiser Clyde stance. Uh, it had this big gilt eagle on the top of it. And it had a cool horn uh, and like the who's who of New York society uh, would ride on it uh, all the way. To, they went up to Montreal at one point. They think go to Chicago. They go down uh, to Florida at one point. Greenway takes it. Uh, so that's pretty pretty neat. Um, and it's kind of one of the fastest boats on the canal. Uh, apparently, the mules hated it. Uh, very scary boat. Um, anyway, though, um, so that's Greenway. It's going to play an important role throughout uh, our story as well, largely. Um, then right across the canal, um, so this this area, you can see kind of uh, the ethnic splits of Syracuse really well. Um, so the English folks, they generally live south side of the canal. North side, uh, originally, that's your German neighborhood. And that is where all those German immigrants we discussed, and in large part, a lot of those, especially early Irish immigrants, before they start heading to the Tip Hill area, uh, are also north side. Uh, so uh, a number of German and Irish breweries uh, get founded on the north side of the canal, including the one highlighted here, uh, Bartels, um, originally founded as Germania Brewing in 1886. Uh, like I said, you can see this north-south split very well at this site, uh, because where today's Niagara Mohawk building is, was where uh, Bartels was. They had their own massive canal side facility uh crumping crumping out uh their signature beer is i believe it's crown beer uh, so germania is up there uh and then more famously uh what's going to compete with greenways for syracuse's largest brewery uh, is built a bit farther up on the north side near the oswego canal uh that is the brewery of benedict haverly uh haverly's brewing company uh founded in uh 1856. Um, it and Greenways will will give each other a run for their money, including in the famous uh, 1890s uh, lager versus uh, ale war. Um, so yeah, Haverly's being a German, he produces lager. Uh, Greenways produces ale. Uh, both want to keep making a lot more beer, so they do both lobby uh, for uh, the need for good pure water to be brought to the city of Syracuse. Uh, by that point, near the Erie Canal, uh, definitely not the Erie Canal, or on Dyer Creek is providing that. Uh, so skinny Atlas Lake water is brought to Syracuse in large part to support uh, the breweries uh, of the canal, uh, though these canal side breweries. Um, so there's that. Um, Kearney's is a big uh, Irish one uh, up on the north side originally. Um, Somewhere else I was going with uh, the Lager Ale War. Oh, right. If anyone's ever been to the Bruseum uh, up in Pompey at Heritage Hill, uh, they have a fun uh, newspaper article that kind of reflects this. Um, we'll get into the prohibition a little bit more later. Um, but there is a this is a newspaper article that accuses, uh, it says, it's from, I think, the 1870s or 1880s, um, the Democrats are trying to steal away German votes uh, by playing up the Lager question. Like, I didn't know what that means. So I called the curator, Bob Searing at the OHA. It's like, Bob, what's this lager war? How are, how are Democrats getting uh, Germans to vote for them because of lager? And it turns out there's these prohibitionists, uh, but the Democrats were arguing that because of the lower ABV uh, of lager, it didn't technically count as alcohol. So uh, <laughs> less restrictions to be put onto it. Because uh, you could just drink uh, evidently infinite amounts of lagers and be fine. Um, so uh, anyway, there's that. Uh, but we shouldn't just focus on the big city breweries that are pumping out, you know, 50 plus thousand barrels of beer a day. Uh, pretty much every canal town has its own uh, brewery. Um, how successful it is depends uh, on a lot of factors. 
Um, one notable one, though, in 1860, another one of these German immigrants, a man by the name of Louis Bierbauer, good name to start a brewery, uh, he founds the Bierbauer Brewery these in uh, Canada Jahari, uh out in the uh, Mohawk River Valley. Uh, and what's really important about uh, the Canada Jahari Brewery of Louis Bierbauer uh, is that in 1876, uh, he sees another promising young uh, German immigrant uh, just moved into town of the name of Francis Xavier Matt, uh, who he gives a job in seven in 1879. Um, if you don't know FX Matt's, uh, yes, exactly. Uh, he is, yes, he's going to move uh, to one of these bigger canal towns. Uh, he learns the art of brewing kind of in part in this beer bower brewery uh, and takes takes his talents to one of the bigger cities uh, to try to compete with the big boys, I guess, um, with his West End Brewing Company, which will be founded in 1888. Um, all right, so those are the breweries, but beer is not just being produced and transported by the Erie Canal, uh, it is also being drank. Oh, I forgot, there's the Annie Laurie, um, plenty of beer drank on her and dispensed from her. Um, but yes, beer uh, is drank as are many other types of alcohol uh, as well. Uh, people who work on canals, canalers, uh, they uh, earn a reputation, uh, especially with the townsfolk of various towns that go through, uh, whether it's earned or not, uh, of being uh, particularly hard drinking folk, um, which says a lot in this time period we were just kind of earlier talking about, right? Um, there is a missionary report um, that is written in 1835, and it notes that there are over 1,500 uh, bars, taverns, groggeries, and groceries where people can acquire alcohol uh, along the Erie Canal. Uh, so that works out to one establishment per quarter of a mile uh, along the Erie Canal where you could purchase an alcoholic beverage. Uh, obviously, there isn't a bar just every quarter mile. They're largely concentrated in cities uh, and around locks. Uh, so I would say one of the great Many ways, uh, the Erie Canal transformed America, gave us one of our great traditions, the traffic jam. Um, at any lock, uh, it takes about 15 minutes for one boat to pass through. Uh, so you could be stuck in a lock for hours. Um, and, you know, a lot of folks figured they had nothing better to do with their time than to grab a beer or two uh, at those uh, locks. So locks gain an especially kind of uh, sordid reputation as well. Um, an interesting thing, so when they built the Erie Canal, uh, obviously it went through people's land. Um, usually it was acquired, acquired through eminent domain. Uh, the state would pay you uh, if parts of your land were taken away. However, one exception to that, they would judge it on if the canal would add value to your land. If you had um, land that was going to be taken over for a lock, the state would say, oh, well, you can open up a tavern at the lock, make all the money back. Um, there's an interesting account in the book, uh, Artificial River by uh, Carol Sheriff, um, talking about there was one family, they were, you know, kind of temperance advocates. Like, I don't wanna, the state says, oh, we're not gonna pay you any money because uh, you can just build a tavern. They're like, well, I don't wanna open a tavern and sell booze to people. Like I'm a farmer. I didn't sign up to like run a grocery store. The state doesn't care. Uh, they say sell your land, then I guess. Um, anywho, um, so uh, yeah, uh, but locks gain a reputation, uh, as do certain cities, especially ones with locks. Is that, uh, is that there this no, this is not. I was actually just about to get to where it is. Uh, this is. It does look like that. It does, yeah. But this is Waterbleat uh, or West, West Troy. Yeah. Um, so. The, the two most notorious towns uh, for their hard drinking, um, and obviously hard drinking often can lead to uh, hard fighting as well, uh, are Buffalo and here, Waterblade, uh, the two ends of the Erie Canal. I know Albany is technically the end of the canal, but a small side canal is built to Troy um, that eliminates a couple of locks. A lot of canalers would take the shortcut to Waterblade instead. Um, it's why Troy grows into a pretty large city in its own right. Um, so why do these two cities become notorious? 
Well, the way you would usually contract to do a, a job on the canal on a boat, uh, you get paid at either the start or the end of it. And usually you're going one way or the other. So uh, canalers, they might not be taking on all the risks of the average sailor, um, but they're still sailors nonetheless. And sailors, they know a few good ways to spend their money um, when, when they get paid. Uh, and that, you know, includes largely going to bars. Um, so these two areas become known as uh, the Barbary Coasts of the East in uh, this area and the Barbary Coast of the West in Buffalo. Uh, Buffalo's particularly notorious uh, because that's also uh, Great Lakes sailors. They've got the same deal worked out where they're all getting paid in Buffalo. Erie Canalers, they're all getting paid in Buffalo. And for some reason, Great Lakes steamboat uh, sailors and Erie Canal boatmen just hated each other. Mm -hmm. So they'd be going at each other's throats uh, whenever they'd see each other. Uh, but Water Bleak, um, this is a rough place. Um, it's interesting. Here's a couple of accounts uh, of it. Uh, a few of the bars there. Some of them had kind of innocuous names. There's uh, the Friendly Inn. Uh, there was one called The Bank. Uh, I imagine that's like when I went to college, you had a bar called The Study Hall. So you could tell your parents, like, oh, I went to the study hall. That's where I spent all of that money, right? Um, but anyway, so you have those. But then you have the other ones. Um, notably, the Black Rag is one of the bar names. And then there's another one called the Tub of Blood. Um, yeah, so uh, I, yep, I'm guessing you're, you've got to be assuming you're getting into a fight if you walk into the Tub of Blood. Uh, and indeed, a uh, newspaper report said of Waterbleed, quote, there are 100 fights a day and one body a week found in the canal. Uh, so, yeah, that's it's a rough and rowdy place, the Erie Canal, with lots of drinking. Um, and that that's not good, uh, generally, for your society uh, to have this sort of thing going on, especially a lot of people are looking and saying that this is a major major uh, problem. And the Erie Canal is going to have a huge impact, well, and this rampant drinking has a huge impact on, um, uh, what am I saying, politics, simply the temperance movement. Uh, so the Erie Canal uh, kind of helps spark what's called the Second Great Awakening, um, this religious revival movement that spreads along uh, due to the ease of transportation, uh, they're preaching a new form of morality that says you have a uh, responsibility to make yourself and society as moral uh, as possible. Um, and out of that spring, a number of reform movements. The Erie Canal is closely linked uh, to the abolition movement, the women's rights movement, and the temperance movement. Uh, and those last three are going to become especially closely linked together, especially after the Civil War and the uh, the issue of abolition kind of fades away. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. One, there's just this general spirit of kind of this Christianity element to it. But also, I mean, we were talking about what we've I already identified several of the issues here. Um, that water bleak, um, it's not just guys in bars who are getting into fights. They're bringing that stuff home. They're also spending all their money uh, at these bars on this alcohol uh, that they're dependent on, um, kind of oftentimes neglecting uh, their wives and families. Uh, and again, this is the 1800s, so women often don't have a lot of rights. They don't have many options. Uh, so if you have an abusive spouse, one who's mishandling all the family's funds, that's a major issue, yes. But was consumption gendered? Um, it's a lot of men who are drinking it, um, but yeah, um, I mean, there's also um, women, uh, I'm, there's a lot of prostitution going on in this uh, these places as well, um, so uh, yeah, um, so you've got these uh, issues, um, kind of, that's how women's rights often gets uh, lumped in with temperance uh, in a lot of ways, uh, because Oh, and I forgot the other thing. Um, you identified already how dangerous it sounds uh, to be doing this, a lot of this stuff while drunk, and it was. So also, I mean, you run the major risk of uh, if your husband's a canaler and dies in an alcohol-related canaling uh, accident, um, 
uh, of families going to fall on some hard times. Uh, so temperance and women's rights become closely linked together. Um, we'll get to that in a second. Let's look at some of the other social impacts before we get there. Uh, a lot of people start individually taking what are called temperance pledges. Um, and things like temperance hotels and restaurants spring up along the canal so you can eat at. Um, you might have noticed earlier in what I said, uh, things like inns and groceries, they were associated with alcohol at the start of this period. Uh, pretty much anywhere you went was going to serve lots of alcohol. Um, but then places like uh, this is Syracuse's home temperance restaurant uh, located about a block off the canal. If you're traveling, you can stay at a place where people also aren't consuming alcohol, uh, like you. Uh, but then temperance societies, they also start pushing for larger societal reforms, first with uh, blue laws, uh, what are so-called, um, kind of these laws that say um, they put various restrictions on how you can sell alcohol, how you can consume alcohol. A lot of people aren't pushing for a total abolition of alcohol uh, throughout much of the 1800s. Um, they just want it reduced. Uh, that's, I mean, you can kind of see that with what I, the example I gave with that lager question, right? Uh, some alcohol, a lot of people are saying you should drink beer. It has a lot less whiskey than, uh, a lot less alcohol than whiskey or something. Um, it's a safer alternative. Uh, another law that gets passed uh, at some point in the later uh, 19th century um, and it's one that we can't imagine today, I'm sure, um, was that uh, in order to buy alcohol, you had to purchase food um, uh, at a restaurant. Um, the idea being, you know, you're going to drink less alcohol because you have to buy food. Uh, and a lot of uh, bar tenders and bar owners aren't super pleased with this, uh, but uh, the canal, it's pretty... Uh, in case you can tell, like they kind of get marginalized a lot of times, canal owners uh, to the edges of society. Uh, they're often looked down upon. Uh, and so as a result, largely you get a lot of immigrants uh, in many cases living along the banks of the canal. Uh, and in, in Buffalo, you've got a lot of Germans living on the banks of the canal. Uh, and they bring with them some of their distinct uh, foods uh, of of various regions of Germany as well, notably uh, the Kolek roll, and they love roast beef uh, as well. So this new law is passed and they say, oh man, how are we gonna make sure this doesn't cut into our profits? They say, let's make the saltiest meal we possibly can. Uh, so thus is born the beef on wet. Um, yes. Uh, you and, can't get a Kimmelwest roll anywhere like east of Batavia. Okay. I'm in Buffalo. I know about this. <laughs> I have French Spanish with it. Yes. Well, you get some, you get some grocery store. You get a Kimmelwest roll. Well, there you go. The horseradish will probably make you drink more too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yes. Uh, yeah. So, uh, the, the Kimmelwest roll is built in a, in, you know, a Erie Canal side uh, tavern, uh, allegedly. Um, there's, it's hard to figure out where exactly the, the, the beef on what came from, but that's generally. Um, you know, you can't pinpoint the exact location, but somewhere in that German neighborhood near the canal. Um, anyway, um, so there's a beef on whack. But like I talked about, temperance will eventually become closely linked uh, to the women's rights movement. I mean, the Women's Christian Temperance Union is uh, very uh, active. It's fed, uh, Susan B. Anthony down in Rochester becomes very active in it, uh, for instance. Um, and uh, you can see how closely linked women's rights and temperance are in that in 1919, uh, both the 18th Amendment, which bans alcohol, and the 19th Amendment, uh, giving women the right to vote, are passed uh, just a couple months apart. That's because the politicians who were elected uh, that session, they're both running on these dual platforms, sort of. Um, so they're both passed 1919. Um, one of those... Uh, one of those amendments I'm a much bigger fan of than the other. Um, so let's talk about the effects of the 18th Amendment. That's the one I'm not a fan of, to be clear. Um, uh, prohibition starts 1919. 1918, this opens up. This is the modern day barge canal, uh, a new 
larger canal system for New York uh, that can take uh, much bigger ships uh, than boats that have previously gone down the first two versions of the Erie Canal. Um, also, very critically, it ends right next to the Canadian border where alcohol is still legal. Uh, so the Barge Canal throughout the next kind of two decades, a uh, well, decade and a half the prohibition exists, uh, is uh, going to be a major outlet for uh, bootleggers. Um, uh, also along the canal, a lot of those canal side breweries we talked about, many of them go out of business due to this. Also in the early 1900s, there was a hop blight, killed tons of New York's hops. Uh, that's why in 1905, that John Taylor brewery goes out of business. They can't profitably get hops anymore. Uh, but then prohibition kills many more of these breweries. Some of them transition over into producing other products. Uh, a lot of them drink related. Uh, so you've got some making ice, uh, soda, um, what are called near beers. They're like non-alcoholic beers. There are other ones where, you know, they'll give you like a brick of, let's say, I don't know, whatever you need to make beer and say, absolutely under no circumstances, put this in water, let it, you know, kind of sit for a few days. Otherwise it will turn into incredibly illegal alcohol. Um, watch out there. Um, so yeah, uh, but then other breweries, there's this one in Rome, uh, I was reading this book, it's pretty funny, honestly, they get caught like four or five times just making beer illegally in their back. ATF came in, broke it up, uh, evidently they just busted open the padlock again and start brewing more beer. Um, so yeah, uh, and they're able again, you can kind of ship uh, some of this alcohol down the canal. Ah, yes. Uh, but then Franklin D. Roosevelt uh, gets elected um, president in 1932, as do a number of, of wet politicians, as they're called. Uh, and in 33, uh, the 21st Amendment is passed, which repeals prohibition. And you may have heard uh, one of the products a lot of breweries made to stay afloat uh, was soda. Uh, including that West End Brewing Company founded by FX Mats we talked about. Uh, they produced a club soda called Utica Club. Uh, however, legend has it, they got word that uh, Prohibition is going to be repealed. So they might have started making some beer a little early uh, under the guise of they were making this club soda of theirs and out rolls the Utica Club, uh, still advertised today as the first beer served after Prohibition. Um, yeah, so um, there you go, right, right along the Erie Canal and the Canal City of Utica. They make a really good root beer, too. Yes, they do. <laughs> um, yeah, um, the UC is not done here either. Uh, a lot of breweries do survive making things like ice and stuff. Syracuse alone has five breweries make it through Prohibition. Uh, one is Zets. Uh, which you know made it all the way through prohibition then 34 that goes out of business uh, bartels made it through closed in 1942 Morin quinn uh, they survived in 1950 greenways uh, which we looked at earlier uh, they last until 1953 uh, and then the last brewery in syracuse um Haverly's. Uh, that will close in 1962 they're the manufacturers of congress uh beer um, ultimately, of the pre-prohibition beers, uh, only two will survive. So why are all these now prohibition stock, right? This was the big kind of hindrance to breweries. Why are all these breweries going out of business? Well, it's what we talked about earlier, transportation and transportation technology. Um, that's really the key. There's now, and also beer making technology. Now, um, things like the 200,000 annual barrels a year that John Taylor could make, there's technology that can make that look paltry. Places like Budweiser, Miller, Schlitz, out in the Midwest, they even produce way more of that beer. They also, those places, Milwaukee, St. Louis, centrally located. And there's now a pretty much fully integrated rail system all across the country. They can ship out their beer much more efficiently to a lot more people uh, and, Refrigerated cars exist now. You can keep your beer tasting well. There's pasteurization uh, as well. So now 
you can open up, you know, a Bud Light in Richmond, Virginia. It's going to taste the same, presumably, as one in San Francisco. Um, so there's a lot of mo lot more competition. You've got to make way more beer, lots more of it, uh, and just kind of keeping up to that scale just proves nearly impossible for a lot of New York State uh, breweries. Uh, same thing with uh, like hops. New York can't compete. One, they've got that hot blight, but two, you've got a railroad that goes to Oregon and Washington. They have even better climates for hops, and they can move that quicker. Yes. Just curious, at post temperance, did the consumption rebound? Not, not as much. Uh, temperance did. I have seen some things that argue that um, the prohibition did work in some ways. Uh, American consumption of alcohol does drop significantly. Um, but uh, and we're we're never back to those levels of like the early 1800s. Um, yeah, uh, only two breweries uh, survive this time period. Uh, and that is the West End Brewing Company and Genesee out in um, Rochester. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Another canal town. Uh, and they do that because they are able to innovate well enough to stay ahead of the curve. Um, Genesee, uh, their big thing, one, they have, they make several new beers that are relatively cutting edge for the time. Genesee Light, and Genesee Cream Ale. Uh, Jenny Cream wins um, gold medals for what a good beer it was. And I think it's 1962, they win the American Beer Festivals. Gold medal for best beer, which I always find hilarious because <laughs> that was, you know, that was the beer we got for ten dollars a thirty pack in college, right? Um, but yeah, the, these are these are innovative. You know, people are like, "Wow, light beer! Sign me up!" Yeah. Um, so they're doing that. They also come up with with slick marketing campaigns. That's actually what does Haberly's in. They invest tons of money in an advertising campaign that just doesn't work. But you could club. They've got their famous Schultz and Dooley, uh, only uh, commercial ever shown on the TV Guide, um, voiced by Jonathan Winter. Uh, this is another one of my favorite ad campaigns. Uh, Beauty Club is where it really swings. This is the late 60s. They're trying to make UC look like it's this cool, exclusive, like swinging club from like San Francisco or something. They've come out with an album, even. It's great. That's one of those weird, like psychedelic names to it. Um, <laughs> So that's fun. I mean, they do a bunch of other gimmicks. You've got things like beer balls, uh, Maximus Supers, which are just have more alcohol than anything else. It helps Vermont bands, Maximus Supers, which really uh, makes them popular. Uh, Genesee <laughs> has, uh, has the Jenny girl, um, who's also a famous advertising person. So they kind of just allow these breweries to keep surviving long enough. Um, but by the 70s, late 70s, even these marketing campaigns, these innovations, they're just not working out anymore. But critically, uh, America is starting to rethink how it deals with food. So after World War II, you know, things like TV dinners, they're, you know, this incredible new technology. The fact that you can get food that tastes the same anywhere in the country, Americans have never experienced that before. But by 60s and 70s, people also start questioning, you know, how are these things being produced? Uh, where is it coming from? Uh, et cetera. Uh, some people are saying, I don't want to eat the same thing as everyone else, right? And eventually that's going to impact beer as well. Craft brewing really starts up in the 70s um, in New York. Um, you know, West End Brewing Company is doing bad. Uh, FX Matz's grandson travels over to Bavaria and kind of relearns the trade of brewing uh, from kind of his grandfather's ancestors, right? Uh, and in 1985, uh, Saranac comes out. Um, West End Brewing Company decides to reinvent itself, start making craft beers, um, different types of beers that pay homage to their kind of history and stuff. Uh, and it becomes pretty successful. It saves uh west end brewing company they also start making things like sam adams they're one of the first breweries to produce and contract out uh for sam adams so they start to become big 
uh, and the craft brewing scene just keeps growing. Um, reaches 1993, Syracuse. Syracuse has its first brewery open since uh, Haverly's went out of business, the Syracuse Suds Company. It's quickly followed uh, by Middle Ages uh, and Empire Brewing. Uh, then people start, you know, the craft beer thing. And well, maybe it is a fad at that point, but it seems like it's starting to take off. More and more places start going in. And now people have to continue to differentiate themselves. And some people figure the way to do that is by embracing history. In some cases, canal history. Uh, the first canal beer I am aware of uh, comes out of Syracuse, made by the Relier Brewing Company in 1998. Uh, they produced their Topap line of beers. Uh, and uh, then the whole brewery starts springing up with canal themes. In Buffalo, you got Big Ditch. Pittsburgh, Lock 32, named after their lock. Um, Erie Cam Stota's got Erie Canal Brewing Company. And this is just a small part of the much larger list of canal themed uh, breweries. Uh, you've got Heel Path out in Frankfurt. That's another uh, notable one. Uh, but then, you know, just kind of tipping your hat to history for some folks wasn't enough. Some people started making their own kind of historically inspired beers, including ones from around the Canal Corridor, uh, including Willow Rock Brewing Company. Uh, in, I believe it's 2019, uh, they partnered with the Onondaga Historic Association, found the historic recipes uh, to Congress beer made by Haverly, uh, and they brought back Congress beer. Uh, then another group, of, but this is the last brewery I want to really highlight, Talking Cursive, these guys are built in that Syracuse brewing location we've looked at several times, where Davenport, Maury, and Kellogg founded the first ever brewery. Then where Greenways was, seven stories tall, right on the canal. Um, then in 2017, Talking Cursive Brewing Company's founded. They buy an old car dealership that ended up taking that place. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's that's now a brewery again. Uh, they uh, had a young enterprising uh, canal educator reach out to them and say, hey, you're in the historic spot of a brewery. You guys should make a beer, right? Uh, and they did that. Uh, 2021, they came out with good old pale ale, um, inspired by Greenway's recipes. Um, we worked with uh, Willow Rock Brewing, the Erie Canal Museum did, uh, to produce Great Canal Collapse. About a time, it's a wheat beer uh, in honor of when uh, Greenway's collapsed into the canal uh, with a uh, adjoining flour milk. So you know, the beer and the wheat got together. Um, uh, and then it actually hasn't made it into this uh, slideshow yet because uh, it only came out two weeks ago. Uh, we came out with American Half and Half, um, another beer with Talking Cursive available in stores today. Uh, $1 goes to the Erie Canal Museum each time you drink it. Um, uh, well, each time you buy it, if you drink it in stages, you know, we don't get an extra dollar or anything. Uh, but then uh, I'll end it on this note. Um, the Erie Canal largely doesn't have commercial shipping on it anymore. Uh, but one of the last major instances where it did does have a great brewing connection. Uh, this is uh, 2017 Genesee Brewing Company did a major expansion. Uh, it's beer tanks were much too large to fit down the throughway uh, or uh, railroad tracks. Uh, so they got shipped down the canal. I think about 20 of them went right by here. Um, 2017, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. And so there you go. Uh, brewing on the Erie Canal is still alive and well today as it has been forever. Are there, oh, we even have events like beers, bikes, and barges. Um, which is great. We do historical tours of different canal towns and end at a different brewery each time. Uh, and if you buy a ticket, you get a, a beer included in the price of your ticket at a different craft brewery. Um, so Syracuse is, is July 13th. But I know we got at least one cyclist in the crowd. Um, so, uh, yeah, any questions? Well, if you think of it, you can always email me here as well. Um, so if you go back to that, this isn't really about the beer. It's more about the canal. You go back to that map that you showed earlier where yeah. the canal got finished and it connected Buffalo and Albany, right? But you talked about how there was the Mohawk 
Yeah. Like, what was the inspiration to not just improve the waterway up to the Great Lakes and then keep and then just use the Great Lakes and try to dig in through the kind of the nowhere land? Excellent question. It was a big debate uh, they had in the 1790s trying to improve the Mohawk. Didn't work out too well. Um, but then the other thing, because they initially thought of just building a canal from Lake Ontario to uh, Albany. That was one of my first questions when I got into the canal. Uh, but the reason was, um, we've still got Niagara Falls you have to deal with, um, which separates Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. Uh, so you'd have to get around that. And uh, the theory was uh, that it would be more beneficial to just keep sending your stuff up the St. Lawrence to Montreal. And it actually might be even more efficient for central New York farmers to ship their products to Montreal rather than down to New York City if you made that system. Also, the War of 1812 had just happened, so we were afraid the Canadians would invade the uh, Lake Ontario. So, you know, why the uh, Canadian travelers were doing uh, the, the Rideau is Rideau. so they could get gunboats into the, the Great Lakes. Um, but the Welland Canal is also a response. The new side that has the old canal like manual. Yes. I'm watching it through time. You feel like going back in history. Yes. Yeah. If you're ever in uh, Ottawa, I suggest checking out their uh, locks. Um, any other questions? Yes. Do you know, you talked about the hoplite a little bit. Is, it, is that still an issue? Do you know what I mean? It is, from what I understand, okay. um, from brewers. Um, they seem to have. Fixed it a little um, yeah. with like pesticides and things, uh, but not, it is still a threat, I know. Um, but um, due to, I didn't mention it, but like the farm brewing laws, um, which encourage you to use uh, New York made hops. Uh, by the 70s, New York wasn't even included in the National Hops Growers list of states that produced hops. Now I think we make something like, I wanna say around 10% of the nation's hops come from New York. Thank you.